Morning, I'm Simon Pickard, I'm an orthopaedic surgeon from Shropshire. Um, here's a picture of Shrewsbury to uh, make you appreciate what you're missing. And um, sorry not to be with you in person, I will have to be in uh, Swansea, it's the BSSH over the next couple of days. Um, however, the, uh, I hope you find this uh, of some use. The uh, task was to discuss rehabilitation of the upper limb in spinal cord injury, and that's both surgical and non-surgical. Um, and uh, if there's time, we'll touch a little bit on uh, a traumatic or and uh, iatrogenic uh, cord injury as well. Why? Um, well, for those that work in the field, I think this is self-evident, but um, the uh, restoration of hand function is a higher priority for tetraplegic patients than anything, any other uh, lost function, higher than uh, bowel and bladder control, higher than sexuality. And the reason is that uh, the use of your hands gives you mobility, it gives you autonomy over your environment, um, the ability to feed or drink without asking, uh, the ability to message uh, your loved ones without having to uh, go through uh, your carer, uh, all of which uh, is both uh, physical and personal autonomy and um, is therefore highly valued. Um, the epidemiology and classification uh, we'll start with uh, talking about classification, which is uh, pertinent today as uh, the classification system we use um, was uh, described in 1973 at a meeting in Edinburgh, uh, led by uh, Eric Moberg, the father of uh, reconstructive surgery from uh, Sweden, and Douglas Lamb, based in Edinburgh. And they published it in this paper and um, Happy days, here's a summary, um, which on the face of it looks a little bit uh, long-winded, uh, not the usual A, B, C, D, E. Uh, however, it's, uh, it's really just the number of muscles that you have that are of adequate strength um, to use as tendon transfers below the elbow. Um, so, and uh, the order is uh, repeatable and uh, predictable. So uh, brachial radialis is the highest, that would make you group one, then ECRL, ECRB, pronator teres, FCR, and so on and so forth, down to uh, group nine, which lack only their intrinsic muscles of the hand, um, and then group N, which is exceptions. Um, and this it gives you a language that you can talk about, and uh, reconstructive strategies for each level have been described, and uh, we'll talk through some of those uh, towards the end. Uh, modifications came along later, so sensation was added. Uh, Moberg is quite uh, fascinating, really. He spent his career um, as a hand surgeon, but uh, re researching into uh, aspects of sensation, and so only uh, took up the mantle of uh, tetraplegia surgery after he retired. Um, a sort of David Ford in, uh, of, the, of Sweden. The, um, so yes, ocular or uh, cutaneous, um, his work prior to uh, tetraplegia surgery was based on eight millimeter two point discrimination being an uh, approximation for your ability to have proprioceptive control of your hands. In other words, to be able to use your hands without having to look at what they're doing. Uh, and in terms of using a hand and its functionality, um, Apart from the obvious, that uh, is, a, is a fairly critical point, but particularly if you have a hand on the other side that's uh, more useful. Um, and then uh, elbow extension and, or triceps function became added as a, as a final modification. So epidemiology, uh, and there's a picture of Moberg on his boat for you just to fill the space. Um, so epidemiology. Um, I think the, uh, the media and uh, the popular view of uh, tetraplegia is that it occurs in uh, this sort of uh, population. Uh, young, fit men involved in uh, risk-taking or violent activity. Um, and that, uh, if you look at the data from mid-70s USA, um, would be a mean age of 28, very few are over 60. And the majority are in the uh, mid 
uh, cervical region, uh, which from a reconstructive point of view is the, uh, is the zone that you have the, um, where you have something to work with um, and uh, something that requires improving. And also complete injuries were over half. And uh, now we'll talk again about that in a minute, but these are, are patients that are easier to manage. Uh, so in comparison, if you then uh, look at the data from uh, Midlands uh, and the Northwest uh, Spinal uh, Injuries Centres, um, so this is a cohort from over two and a half years where we reviewed 260 patients. Um, and they're, they're a completely different population. So you can see that the average age is 63. 42% um, of them are over 60 years of age. And uh, complete injuries are really a minority. So this is an elderly population. And they have a lot of spasticity and pain. So they're incomplete. Um, and they're higher as well. So the, their ability to tolerate surgery um, or to be suitable for reconstructive surgery is, uh, is uh, extremely limited. And if you follow that cohort, so again, this is just from the Midlands uh, Spinal Injury Centre. Um, if you follow 186 patients from around that time, you can see that uh, fortunately for them, about a third are too good. Um, there's 20% lacked physical or mental capacity, 10% died during the first year. And as you follow that down, you end up with just under 20% being suitable for surgical reconstruction, uh, which is a, a fairly uh, small proportion. So the, the demographics aren't perhaps what you might think um, superficially. <clears throat> the uh, population that we have to deal with now, as with everything else in the health service, is a much more frail, um, group with uh, significant comorbidities and challenges uh, far beyond the, uh, the historical image of a young fit man. Um, so moving on, the, we'll talk a little bit about uh, strategies to improve upper limb function, <coughs> um, non-surgical and then surgical, and then we'll move on to uh, who, where and when. Um, so. For the acute management, it's really about uh, support. So the, uh, the worst scenario for us is that uh, secondary complications have then limit our potential, and that might be pressure sores <clears throat> that prevent a patient from sitting out. Um, it's very difficult to rehabilitate your arms when you flatten your back. Um, contractures, a death to uh, function. You can't, if you, you can restore motors, but if you don't have joints that move, and they're not functional. Um, positioning to protect the ulnar nerve uh, and psychological and social support. The patient uh, needs to be in a position where they can uh, consider or um, discuss uh, restoration of upper limb function uh, in a, uh, in, with an understanding of where they are rather than a hope that uh, we have a, a cure for them. The uh, contractures, as I say, are extremely problematic. Um, so this is a fairly common pattern. This is a uh, relatively high tetraplegic patient. He has C5. C6 is a bit spastic, so he's got overactivity in biceps, but he's got nothing below that. And this leaves the hand supinated. The wrist then drops into extension. Occasionally there's uh, spasticity in his long extensors. Yeah, and they're a little bit C6-y as well. And you end up with a hand that is uh, stuck, supinated and uh, wrist extended with no uh, prospect of function and uh, cosmetically um, not uh, ideal and uh, awkward to manage in terms of uh, skin care and uh, simple things like dressing. And uh, spinal injuries or tetraplegic patients so have a particularly uh, difficult form of uh, spasticity and contracture. Um, and I think it's the, uh, the worst common um, combination is a spastic muscle with uh, paralysis against it. Spasticity with uh, um, 
versus normal muscle can often be overcome. Um, normal versus paralysis you can manage, but when gravity and spasticity work together uh, with paralysis in the other side, uh, often it's uh, an unmanageable uh, situation. However, I, the, uh, the way, like all things, you start with passive range of movement exercises, um, and then uh, you can uh, augment that with uh, stretching exercises and splintage. Uh, failing that, you then need to uh, move forward into uh, Botox and uh, ultimately your uh, rehabilitation colleagues to uh, provide uh, um, systemic uh, spasticity treatment. Just to uh, briefly divert, sometimes spastic can be good, um, particularly if it's balancing out spastic muscles on the other side. And um, your patients uh, will use their tone, uh, even if it's not necessarily spasticity, to enhance uh, hand opening and closing uh, when they use, if they use a tenodesis. So if you've got good wrist control, you can bring your wrist up and the hand will passively contract. But that's often quite loose. Um, but if there's a little bit of tone, so if they're uh, slightly more upper motor neuron um, at that level, rather than a flaccid uh, paralysis, that tone will enable them to grip. And uh, some patients are quite good at triggering spasticity. So they'll stretch their arm out to trigger uh, spastic flexors and then can uh, get it to hold on something. Simil similarly, they, can, uh, you, they rely on the tone in uh, their extensors to uh, aid hand opening. So not always bad, um, but when it, it goes bad, it's really, really bad. So um, restoring balance is a uh, okay. forward. Um, sorry, it's a bit noisy. Um, and at this point, for those of you who don't work um, within the uh, spinal injuries community, there are certain, uh, there are, they, skills and uh, equipment and opportunities available um, that perhaps aren't there uh, outside. Okay, and I, I think if you have a patient that uh, has a, a spinal cord uh, disturbance, whatever reason, then uh, looking for help within spinal injuries can be useful. So this is uh, an exoskeleton that we have, so it's EMG controlled, but the patient has no active elbow flexion, but they can initiate enough activity um, for the uh, EMG sensors to pick it up and then uh, okay. control the elbow flexion. So you can start rehabilitating uh, upper limb function um, before you can see clinically discernible uh, muscle activity. <clears throat> and there's a multitude of uh, strategies to achieve this. Um, okay, bend your arm. in terms of various aids, mobile arm supports, for example. It doesn't have to be hugely uh, high-tech or um, expensive, but uh, we are increasingly um, using uh, EMG and uh, functional electrical stimulation as ways of enhancing uh, motor uh, reorganization and uh, engagement. Educate is important, the, um, and you'll be surprised how how many patients can achieve really quite good hand function with a very little uh, in the way of motors. If they've got good wrist extension, um, then with AIDS and with a tenodesis grip, they become quite adept at uh, using a phone, drinking, cutlery, those sort of day-to-day uh, -day, uh, essentials. So the, uh, the first priority is to rehabilitate, 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 and educate. Um, other, so we're moving slightly on to uh, surgical involvement at this point. Um, and the first thing I would uh, ask is that um, concurrent injuries are treated with, uh, particularly fractures are treated with rigid internal fixation, and that there is an assumption that there will be neurological recovery. I think to give up on your patient um, early in their pathway on the basis that they're uh, tetraplegic uh, dooms them to um, 
to a, a poor outcome. And if you, if, with regards to the wrist, as in the examples here, if you have K wires for a distal radius fracture, your physiotherapists are unable to move that wrist to uh, maintain its passive range. And uh, if there is then recovery, a stiff wrist will uh, negate um, tenodesis and the uh, opportunity for hand function will be lost. So it's critical that the patient can uh, and the therapy team can uh, passively and actively uh, rehabilitate the limb because uh, the fixation is uh, such that it will allow that. Um, the second indication really is, is for resistant or progressive contractures. Um, and that's a thorny one I, without a really good solution, I have to say. Um, but to restore balance, uh, for example, with the flexed supinated uh, elbow, it is possible to transfer biceps early um, and release the elbow contracture to uh, bring the arm out again. It's uh, Conceptually, it's not a complicated thing. I think the, uh, the realities are sometimes slightly harder. Uh, not least of which are these uh, high tetraplegic patients who are not uh, often uh, fit for anaesthesia because of respiratory issues, among others. And then finally, uh, in the uh, younger group, um, those that have potential for nerve transfers um, are worth uh, considering. Nerve transfers are a, a fairly new technique. Um, they uh, Conceptually, you're taking uh, a nerve instead of a muscle and uh, putting it into a new nerve. It, there are there are various uh, subtleties about this that you can talk at length. Um, but uh, for the sake of uh, the next 15 minutes, I would say that they undoubtedly work best in young patients and early. So if we have a uh, young, let's say under 35 arbitrarily um, patient, who comes in and would be suitable, then we'd aim to try and meet with them at three months from injury. And uh, if the uh, rehab team are happy that they're in a position where they can talk about this, go through the concept with them um, and uh, answer any questions. And if they are interested, start making plans for surgery at the six month mark. Um, but the definitive decision being then made um, at the five month mark. So see them at three months, start considering it and planning um, and with the aim to get the nerve transfers done by six months. And then uh, spasticity surgery again is uh, a thorny issue. Um, so for example this gentleman, his right arm is not as contracted as the previous guy but he's also another patient who's stuck in supination. He's had biceps rerouting. Um, so he's turned uh, biceps from a supinator into a pronator and that allows his hand to sit in a pronated position and it cosmetically looks better but perhaps more importantly he can then uh, put his hand on a joystick to drive his chair or help reach out and use a touch screen with his index finger <clears throat> or if he's uh, got enough control of his elbow um, with a feeding strap could take food from a bowl to his mouth should he wish. So something conceptually and surgically quite simple um, by turning the forearm over into pronated position can uh, take an arm from being almost non-functional to having some uh, basic but quite important uh, use. So um, I'm not really sure why he was there in the sequence of things, but uh, back to nerve transfers. So uh, these, uh, so the main one or the most effective one is the supinated posterior interosseous. And we'll look at that again in a minute. Um, this one is uh, uh, muscular cutaneous to anterior interosseous, uh, which was for a while uh, done up in the level of uh, the arm. Um, so down at the bottom in this slide in the middle, you can see the uh, median, the um, median nerve and there's a fascicle coming out of it. <clears throat> Up at the top is a branch of the nerve to brachialis that's been swung over and anastomosed in. And the axons then will regenerate from the point of the anastomosis down the recipient nerve um, and uh, reanimate the hand. Um, so moving on, this is a uh, this is now a supinated spin transfer. 
uh, so of the nerves exposed uh, using a uh, nerve stimulator and you can adjust the uh, millivolts to evaluate the sensitivity so that's currently the nerve to supinator um, so that's going to be the donor nerve the one before that was the uh, posterior interosseous nerve and then this is a branch to ECR B which uh, sometimes is shared as a small twig going to supinator but there's also a twig going to ECRB uh, so then we leave that so it's uh, conceptually straightforward you would divide uh, the nerve to supinator and uh, swing it across and put it into the posterior interosseous nerve um, if you're lucky and it's not a motor neuron lesion the posterior interosseous will have a full house of axons and uh, the axons from supinator will grow down it and they have the ability to upgrade so you really only need 20 percent of a full set of axons to uh, generate uh, normal power in a recipient muscle and so we can use that ability to uh, upgrade if you like um, And then uh, this is the same patient as the intraoperative video and this is her now at six months uh, so prior to her nerve transfer she had a wrist extension but no hand opening uh, whereas now she has uh, quite good control of her thumb and fingers and will be ready to go on to the second stage <clears throat> So um, standard management or well, historically would be uh, to uh, sit tight and uh, see what recovery you get, let the patient get home uh, and settle in their own environment. And it's the spot between the patient still being early enough in their journey to want to consider um, taking on uh, interventions that are, are quite uh, time consuming and uh, intrusive for the patient. Um, and yet uh, not being so early that they're not really ready um, psychologically or they, uh, they're still recovering. <clears throat> so we'd aim to see patients at 12 months from injury um, and uh, if uh, suitable as an MDT um, we would uh, discuss tendon transfers with them and come up with a package of uh, treatment and that can be quite uh, prolonged. So the, uh, the preoperative workup would be score video uh, scoring and uh, it's surprising how often people, including us, forget what the hands were like preoperatively. Um, some basic scoring, so COPM is the Canadian Outcome Performance Measure, which is a, a patient goal uh, achievement uh, score and then uh, sometimes the Solomon Hand Function Tests. They need their domestic arrangements uh, sorted so that they can uh, be discharged home afterwards for example they won't be able to transfer themselves and will need a hoist um, and uh, won't be able to self-propel so they do if these aren't organized for them then you end up with uh, them stuck in hospital for a prolonged period which is frustrating for everybody and then uh, preconditioning and training of the donor muscles can help with uh, post-operative uh, rehabilitation so the priorities really depend on what uh, donor muscles you have available and what's there already. Um, however, generally, elbow, the restoration of elbow extension um, is first, and that then provides a, a stable platform, for, particularly for muscles that cross the elbow, um, to be used for donors, for example, brachioradialis, which is an elbow flexor. It's very difficult to engage as a thumb flexor uh, if you don't have an elbow that uh, is uh, stable. 
for uh, elbow extension, the uh, deltoid to triceps involves taking the posterior third of deltoid uh, using fascia lata or uh, tibialis anterior grafts uh, to reach the triceps tendon. It's quite a prolonged rehabilitation program. Um, historically, it used to be three months, although the Swedes have now shortened that to uh, six weeks. We'll see whether we can follow. The alternative is biceps to triceps, um, and there is a nerve transfer, teres minor, to triceps as well. So um, that would be the first step. And then once uh, elbow extension is restored, uh, you can then uh, look at grip reconstruction. If there is uh, only uh, wrist extensors, if you've got break radialis um, and no wrist extensor, you can transfer that in to provide a wrist extension. Then you need to tighten the flexors to provide an enhanced tenodesis. Um, if you got as you go further down, uh, then you get more options. And really, once you get to IC3, so that as you've got two wrist extensors and breaker radiators, you're then uh, up and running. Um, the Swedes who love uh, an acronym have put together the alphabet procedure. Um, and that is a, a package of uh, active tendon transfers for grip and passive tina DCs uh, for hand opening combined with uh, some balancing procedures. Uh, the, if you then add in the spin transfer for hand opening, you can really you can provide quite a useful uh, limb. And so for us, and it's not the same everywhere, I would uh, aim to do nerve transfers at six months, let the dust settle and uh, a year down the line, see whether they've got any elbow extension um, from the nerve transfer and uh, plan. Hopefully they have, and then you can move on. You can skip that stage, move on to grip reconstruction. And if they've got uh, posterior interosseous nerve innervated, then that also gives you um, EDQ as a possible opposition transfer for the thumb. And you've got much better active hand opening. Um, so that uh, simplifies things. The alphabet procedure um, is the advanced balance combined digital extensor flexor grip reconstruction, um, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And as I say, the uh, this workhorse is uh, using breaker radialis for FPL and uh, ECRL for FDP. Obviously, the latter is synergistic and much easier transfer to learn. Um, you then combine that with uh, intrinsic house intrinsic reconstruction to help with uh, hand opening, um, some tenodesis to uh, control the uh, IPJ flexion of the thumb, and uh, potentially uh, tightening of ECU to rebalance the wrist. But the uh, the work the centre of it is the tendon transfers, and then you can add uh, whichever bits <coughs> you want to adjust coronal posi wrist position, thumb positioning. Uh, and hand opening. I think we're probably on fire. Um, rehabilitation has uh, accelerated now with the side to side uh, transfer repairs rather than the pull taft weaves of history. Um, you can achieve early mobilization. So if uh, someone underwent grit reconstruction for us on a Wednesday, uh, they'd have Thursday off and uh, Alison, the therapist at Oxford Street, would then see them on Friday, splint them, start them going. And this is a video from um, uh, Swedish colleagues uh, showing. So this is a patient who's now at five days um, demonstrating uh, grip. And I, you get uh, more uh, fluid movement, you get less adhesions, and uh, they lose uh, strength less. Some of the uh, intrinsic reconstructions are a little bit uh, more tenuous, so you, they don't let them grip tightly until um, six weeks. So the um, what have we learned in the past year? Uh, I think you can be conned by a, a patient's uh, capacity to uh, tolerate surgery, especially older patients, and we need slightly uh, simpler algorithms for them. Um, we need to just slow down a little bit on uh, 
tight grip and um, we need to uh, improve our scoring and uh, encourage the uptake of reconstructive surgery nationally. We have a Tetrahan group that uh, meets once a year, uh, which is uh, an MDT meeting uh, with uh, therapists, surgeons, uh, rehabilitation uh, specialists and some bioengineers. And that's been hugely helpful. This year, we uh, surgeons meet every uh, three months to uh, discuss cases that we have uh, coming up for surgery. And uh, really, the intention was to provide support for, uh, for surgeons who are relatively uh, working on their own. And that's uh, brought us closer. I think the uh, as we're coming to the end, it's worth um, just briefly touching on uh, uh, cervical cord dysfunction following uh, decompressive surgery. And I've, I've seen a few patients that have uh, had that experience. And I, I, to the uh, spinal surgeons in the audience, I would say this, I would seek um, support from um, your spinal injuries team or an upper limb specialist um, early. My observation is these have always been uh, highly emotive uh, events uh, with uh, always from the patient's perspective and often from the surgical team as well, a degree of guilt or um, a feeling that it's uh, an iatrogenic events that happen in surgery. I, the ones I've seen, and uh, I think I've seen five patients, interestingly, each from a different uh, unit, have a very similar pattern of uh, deficit. That is um, C5, 6, and sometimes 7, uh, generally unilateral. And I, I, I'm absolutely convinced this is a uh, reperfusion injury. It, I don't believe it's an iatrogenic intraoperative uh, accident that this occurs. Um, but uh, I think you may find that having an outside opinion um, can uh, perhaps sometimes pour oil onto uh, troubled waters, and that can be helpful for the patient in particular. Um, but also we have access to different uh, rehabilitation techniques and experiences that can help get the best out of uh, things for your patient. Um, in a similar vein, I, for those patients that have um, had ischemic or uh, infective uh, etiology to their paralysis, um, they are, are, are difficult, they're often high, the injury to the cord is extensive. Um, I, I do not believe they do well with uh, uh, nerve transfers, and that includes uh, children with uh, myelitis. And I, I would be cagey about uh, surgeons who are offering um, outcomes that perhaps are not always realistic. And I would uh, encourage you to seek someone who has experience in the field. Um, to provide support for these patients. If you're interested, um, there's a book by Caroline Clerk and Rod Vincent uh, Hence, um, which is excellent, but uh, hugely expensive because it's out of print. Um, but there's also Karina Reinhold's uh, thesis. Um, Karina's the uh, head of the team in Gothenburg, um, so the uh, successor to um, to Jan Frieden and uh, before him Eric Moberg and her thesis is available on the internet for free if you google it and it's a uh, it's a detailed idiot's guide to uh, reconstructive surgery with colored pictures and diagrams um, so you might find that helpful. Uh, so to close here is uh, my patients who can now play the guitar very badly but are very happy with that as an outcome. Um, and I think with the, uh, with the right team and uh, motivated patients, you can achieve a lot.
Thank you.